Hello, hello everyone. Today I'm going to be featuring the Jervis, one of my top picks for this season and probably one of the best DDs that you can possibly play in ranked. Um, matchmaking wise, we got three battleships, three cruisers and an enemy destroyer. Um, obviously you prefer to actually face more DDs in the Jervis because it's such an excellent DD duelist. It has fast reloading smokes, excellent DPN, hydro, and a fairly good concealment. It does get outspotted by the likes of Z39, Shiratsuyu, Gajamada, but of those only, oh sorry, not Gajamada, but um, Haida. Of those though, the Haida is the only one that really competes with it in DPM, and most of the rest of the time, well, the ships that are spotting you are unlikely to actually pick fights. The first thing I do is push straight through the center. Note, if the enemy would have a radar, I would be playing more safe than this, because the risk of being radar here would be high, so you want to play more defensive. In this case, I would potentially have gone through the center to secure the objective instead of taking this northern route. The reason for taking this northern route is that I want to provide as much spotting for my team as possible. When you play a DD for your team, especially if you're the only DD, you have a heavy burden on your shoulders. You need to be not just contesting the objective, but also providing significant significant amounts of spotting for the team. I pop Hydro because RPF is pointing towards C, so the DD is sailing past straight towards, straight, straight towards C. I am pinging it uh, repeatedly to let my team know where the DD is moving. Hopefully they understand what I mean by the pings. Uh, but more importantly, I'm playing it very safe, because that smoke up there is a Gorizia. And even though I outgun an Akatsuki, if I were to pick a fight with the Akatsuki right now, he would have the support of a Gorizia and a Fiji. And honestly, my team is sitting fairly far back, and I don't think that I would get as much support as he does. As soon as I secure, secure the objective, there is a loner on the flank, the Scharnhorst. Because I know where the deed is, and I know where the rest of the ships are, there is a chance of a potential flint sitting next to the Scharnhorst, but the chances are fairly low. So I'm gonna see if I can maybe cut him off with some torpedoes. Keep in mind that Jervis torpedoes are very short range. 7 kilometers. However, if you can catch ships trying to push into objectives, like for example if the Scharnhorst would have been pushing in, I would have potentially gone for the YOLO close to the island or just for the standard torpedoes as he tries to go in. However, he is taking the safer route, which is disengaging, and because he's taking the safer route, I'm just going to capture the objective while trying to keep him spotted for my team. We have a Sinop and a Gneiser now that are both pushing this cap. Not perhaps that necessary, I would like to see them uh, positioned more centrally, but then again I prefer having battleships in a very central position because of the potential crossfire and the range that they can cover. But on a small, small map like this, a uh, battleship can basically shoot across the map easily. I reverse, or more, more importantly, I turn my ship around so I can move towards the center. There is nothing for me to stop here. A common mistake you see DDs do is there's a solo battleship on a flank, so they sail off and they chase him and they try to land torpedoes, and then they spend 15 minutes trying to land torpedoes on that one battleship, while the rest of the team is completely without any spotting, without any capping power, and they, they basically they just lose their eyes and they lose the game because of that. So I'm not going to be wasting time on a solo Scharnhorst sailing around. I rather I sail straight towards B and try to defend it. I call target to defend it. At this point though, even though I would once again like to play aggressive, I can't be sure. Is it a flint or is it an Akatsuki? So what I do is I just contest the cap, I ground and I start reversing. This gives me better options of disengaging should the flint decide to push around the island or and decide to YOLO me. Also, from this position from behind the island, I can start harassing the Fiji. Note that I zoom out every now and then and I call target on him. This is something you want to be doing a lot when you're playing a destroyer. Oftentimes the D the, your team won't really understand what is the biggest threat and you need to be the one basically directing the fire control. When it comes to carrying, it's more than just killing a lot, it's basically herding your team around like a bunch of kittens, like forcing them to do the right thing. In this case, I'm calling target on the Fiji while farming him, trying to force him to use the smoke. If he uses the smoke, I can reverse further out and provide more spotting and fight enemy ships without risking being spotted by the Fiji. He does smoke up, 
and then Ashitaka pushes in. I, once again, will start calling target on the Ashitaka, because he is the most vulnerable target. He's overextended, he's in the center, he has no cover, he doesn't have enough health pool, his positioning is terrible and we should be able to kill him, especially in an Ashitaka, which is a fairly squishy ship. My team actually managed to kill that Fiji in the smoke, so right now the game is looking pretty good. Our position is looking fairly strong. However, my Synops position, he could have stayed nose in and maybe reversed behind the island, but he decided to panic turn out and he's eating a lot of damage while doing so. And the Ashitaka is not dying nearly as fast as I would like. I want to see if I could perhaps catch this flint off guard. The flint is obviously sitting in the smoke and farming. Akatsuki doesn't reload quite as fast or shoot quite as many shells. And my goal here is to maybe try to dislodge him from this cap. Our synop goes down, but the Ashitaka is also going to go down. I'm not going to waste torpedoes or firepower on a ship that's already dead. That is a waste of time. I zoom in and I note that there's actually two smokes. Make sure that you enable the smoke boundaries in the options menu because it's very important. It looks like one big smoke, but when we zoom in, we can actually see that the closer smoke is probably the Akatsuki and the smoke behind is probably the flint. And if I tried to torp now, my torps would not reach as they are only seven kilometers. An easy way to make a check if your torps can reach is to zoom in on where he's sitting and check the distance meter. He however decides to push in, I pop smoke, not because I want to sit here and farm, no I just want to break line of sight with him. And this is something only really the Jervis can afford to do, wasting a smoke like this. And I just speed away and before he can shoot I get into cover behind the island. Note that I got good RNG, I caused two fires, one which he can't repair. I angle away because I expect the Gorizia to shoot, he shoots, I dodge the sap. It's very important, Gorizia's reload is very poor, just like Zara's, but he does hit like a truck. So, you can sail in a straight line for 10 seconds, but then when he's about to be reloaded, Attention. make sure Reporting you're angled. I land a torpedo on the flint, which means the flint is on fire and flooding. But this is not a fight I can take, I still don't know where the Akatsuki is. So I'm just calling target on the flint and disengaging. My team is positioned very, very poorly this game, sadly, and this is not something uncommon to rank. People often don't understand positioning because it's one of the hardest things to do in World of Warships. And the, issue, the reason why my team's positioning is so bad is that, yes, they are very safe, but they also can't support their team in any way. They can't support the Gneiser now that just got farmed to death, and they can't support me. And this is why I'm playing very safe, and now I ping them, trying to make them realize that, hey, guys, you can't play this safe. I catch vision of the Akatsuki, but, and I instantly smoke up. Once again, even though I might have gotten behind cover just fine behind the island, it was not worth taking the risk. Jervis's strength is these Royal Navy smokes that have a very, very short cooldown, and this allows you to break fission very, very quickly. It's, they're not that good for sitting in them for a long time to farm, but they are extremely good at temporarily breaking the vision of the enemy team, making them focus on something else, potentially forcing an enemy DD like this Akatsuki to smoke up, and even in this case, disengage. This is the only cap we have. And it's very important that I keep this cap in our favor because the enemy team does have fairly equal points and with two caps they can quite easily run away Torpedo with the points board. lead, especially because my team has such poor positioning. Had I abandoned this cap, they could have pushed in and created a crossfire basically all around my team. So it's very important that I try to hold on or at least delay them as much as possible on this side. I'm playing safe, once again, until my smoke is ready. Note that when there is a radar around, you have to play safer around the area that the radar covers. Sinop looks like he's trying to push in, and obviously Jervis is a Royal Navy DD, so we can launch single launch torpedoes. Note that you don't want to stack every single torpedo on the exact same white line. You want to kind of create this super narrow spread that it's still spread out a bit. You don't need to land 10 torpedoes to kill a ship. So if you launch all torpedoes on the white line and he changes his course, well, all 10, 10 torpedoes are going to miss. But if you make it a slightly wider, but still very narrow spread, you will probably land two, three torpedoes on a ship that has used his damage con. That can be very deadly indeed. And honestly, on any ship, the damage is still going to hurt significantly. 
and I do manage to catch him with two torpedoes nose in, and that is two floodings. I think I got one on his nose and one on his turn, and as we can see from the damage numbers, he does not have damage con available because he used it while pushing in. Normally, Synops tend to have a lot of Kuznetsov, but this guy does not, so those floodings will quickly take down his ship, keeping us in the game and keeping our control on this side of the map. The My Mayoko and Leon are both going north, not something that requires two ships. Uh, I am pointing out poor positional choices. If there's a free cap, you don't send two ships there, you send one ship to go take the free cap, while the other t ship helps the team maintain fire control, maintain positional uh, and crossfires and so forth. So both ships going up there is obviously a mistake. The Leon might realize this as he is turning around, but at this point I suspect my shorts will die, but he's actually choosing to rush in. And the fact that he chooses to rush in means that I can use him as a distraction. It will take them some time to kill him, because it's only a Sharnhorst and an Akatsuki. And that time it takes for them to chip down the shores is time I can use to re-enter this cap. Note that the Sharnhorst is angled away, which means that if the Akatsuki pushes through, which I suspect he will, I will be able to take a 1 vs 1. And the Akatsuki just torpedoed, which means his torpedoes are probably still on cooldown. He pops up around the corner, and as expected, he's forced to use his guns because his torpedoes are not yet available. However, I do suspect they will become available soon, so I instantly stop as I know I will kill him quite soon. The reason I stop is I don't want to be caught full with his full broadside towards me, because he might get some last ditch torpedoes off and kill me off. Killing him, I'm still contesting, the cap is still contested, which means the Sharnhorst is still in here. I pop Hydro, trying to get some vision of where he is. He is pushing through. Note that I only launch one set of torpedoes, five sets of torpedoes. If you do use single launch, you either launch five or ten or none. If you launch something like three, well, the last two torpedoes will keep that torpedo tube from reloading. So always launch five. That way it starts reloading and it will be, be available later on when you might need it. Sharnhorst takes down my Algerie and we are still hanging on. Kind of close, honestly, because uh, our Leon can easily get killed and my Oku doesn't have too much health. Torpedoes I crawl forward, destroyed. running Hydro in case the Sharnhorst torps, and he does, in fact, torpedo. I think the smoke is about to fade, I can see it fading, so I'm going to use it to get an idea of what the Sharnhorst is doing, as my smoke is once again available. He is turning in, which is all the information I needed. I call target on the Garizia, and my Mayoko actually kills him off. That Sharnhorst, if he shoots, he does, and that's all the, all the mark I needed. The Sharnhorst shooting means that his guns will now be on reload for almost 20 seconds. And I can use these 20 seconds to make sure that these torpedoes are lined up perfectly. I take my sweet time, launch the volley. Sharnhorst guns will be reloaded at this moment, time, so he will be able to kill me. But it no longer matters, because my torpedoes are able to trade his life and win us the game, as we still have the Leon and the Mayoko left alive. This was an example of multiple strengths that the Jervis brings. Namely, incredible firepower, those fast-acting smokes that aren't necessarily that useful for sitting in smoke and farming ex for extended uh, amounts of time, but they are so incredibly useful for making those quick escapes. You pop the smoke, you disengage, you break line of sight, and then you re-engage from another angle when the smoke is available again. Jervis rewards player skill and positioning extremely highly. And the torpedoes are also powerful, both in the narrow spread, as you saw towards on the Sharnhurst towards the end, and against the flint as well, but also in their single launch mode, where the nose-in pushing Sinop got caught by two of them and flooded to death. Gun power wise Akatsuki never really had a chance, and all of these things combined, the Hydro, the Concealment, the Smoke, the Firepower, the Torpedoes, both in the Narrow and the Single Launch, is one of the reasons why this was one of my top picks for this season. Jervis is fundamentally a carry destroyer. There is no ship that Jervis won't do quite well against. It can absolutely YOLO battleships, it can even catch the cruisers off guard with those extremely narrow torpedo spreads or wonky spreads, and it can 
fight fairly against pretty much any DD in the game. The only gun, the only gunboat that will really cause a significant amount of trouble is the Hyda. And the reason for that is the Hyda's 5.7 km concealment with a lot of firepower to boot, which makes it very hard to deal with it. But on the other hand, if there are many other battleships around. The Haida struggles to deal with the battleships, whereas a Jervis is very, very potent at dealing with battleships, as this game probably showed. Team score-wise, 2.5k base, which is always nice. I did die in the end, but dying after you have secured, um, after you have secured your team the lead or the win doesn't really matter. It's a perfectly fine trade. And ultimately what matters is in ranked is winning the match. Everything else is secondary. Detail report wise, surprisingly only 17k spotting, but honestly I did spot a fair bit for the team. I tried to provide vision. It did help us catch uh, the Gorizia and I did spot a fair bit in the center, but the team didn't really capitalize on it perhaps as much as I would have liked. Damage wise, only about 32k gun damage, 60k torpedoes, and normally you get more fire damage, but this time flooding was on our side. Jervis is a great ship, and let me show you guys my recommended build for it. Right, as always, let me start off with the modules. Obviously, you do want to start with the hull upgrade before getting the range upgrade. You get that uh, health advantage and the maneuverability. The AA, not that important for ranked for obvious reasons. No more speak of it, speaking about premium consumables. You, know, you run everything premium. Thankfully, the patch has made that possible without needing to tell you guys. Upgrade-wise, turret and torpedo survival, extremely important. Engine room protection. You can run the increased hydra as well. In fact, if I had it, I would probably be running it. It is very useful. It basically makes you immune to torpedoes because the Jervis is such an agile destroyer. Um, however, if you don't have it, just run engine room like I'm doing on this account. Torpedo tubes modification. It gives you traverse speed, reduces the chance of them breaking, and more importantly, it bumps up that speed to 62 knots. None of the other upgrades are really that useful on the ship. Finally, a rudder shift for the simple reason that you can't run acceleration because it's a Royal Navy destroyer, but it does leave you with some pretty crazy maneuverability, 2.8 second rudder shift and a 590 meter turning circle. The Jervis is incredibly agile. If you have hydroactive and you got this agility, eating torps is player mistake more than anything else. Captain build wise, of course, if you have any special captains like for, for example, Cunningham, I do highly recommend it. But once again, this is my Russian normal account, which is very much a a uh, fairly poor account that doesn't have access to all the goodies that the CC account has. Well, I could technically move a Jack Dunkirk over, I guess, um, but it doesn't have any of the goodies. A standard captain is perfectly fine. Jervis doesn't need the gimmicks. It does well with any captain. Start off with priority target, build into last stand, survivability expert and concealment expert. Once again, you always start by building survivability because staying alive is the single most important thing a DD can bring to the team. After you have these, you work on your dueling capacity by building basic firing training, adrenaline rush, and then finally radio location. So very useful. It lets you know where close by enemies are, and especially in tier seven ranked where the maps are very small and there's a lot of island cover, this thing will save you from being ambushed more often than not. Flag-wise, you do want the speed and the fire chance, or actually speed and detonation. Those are the two most important. Build-in fire chance, flooding chance, faster consumables. You do want to be able to chain those smokes as quickly as possible. And after that, it's kind of free for all. This build does leave you with a pretty nice cooldown of 66 seconds on the smoke and it lasts for 40 seconds. So you got about half a minute of downtime, but usually it's pretty easy to play around it, just like you saw in that commentary. Jervis, a very strong pick for this season of Ranked. It's got a lot of things going for it. Firepower, concealment, maneuverability, torpedo power, health pool. It's an all-rounder that has no real weakness. 
besides obviously it's something that simply can't be countered by a dd for example a belfast which is a reason why the belfast is also one of my top picks for the season anyway i hope you guys enjoyed this short jervis guide and i will talk to you guys later